Good morning, Blue Mountain Salvos, and welcome to church online this morning. I know you much prefer to be with us in person, but let's never forget the church was never about a building. It was, is, and always will be about God's people living out their faith by loving God and loving each other. So once you grab yourself a coffee, grab your Bible, grab a chair, and let's figure out how to do that together. Good morning, Blue Mountain Salvos, and welcome to our online worship service this morning. Uh, We're so glad that you're here to, to worship, to pray, to hear from God's Word, and then learn how to apply it to your life. In our, in our Blue Mountains reading plan, in the weeks ahead, we have a number of readings uh, from the book of Psalms. And one that I found uh, inspirational today is, uh, is Psalm 100, which says, Shout for joy to the Lord all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before Him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is He who made us and we are His. We are His people the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. So this morning as we come together, let's start off on the right foot. Let's start off with worshipping him, with praising him for his majesty, for his holiness for the good things that he has done for us and proclaim that in response to that, we live to be in ministry, to be on mission, to be in service to him. So let's sing together.
shall I return to the Lord for all his goodness to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his faithful servants. Truly I am your servant, Lord. I serve you just as my mother did, and you freed me from my chains. I will sacrifice a thank offering to you and call on the name of the Lord. I will fulfill, fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people, in the courts of the house of the Lord in the midst of Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. We live to serve his majesty. Amen. The Bible reading today comes from Genesis 18, and we're going to be reading the first 15 verses. Uh, and whilst the words will appear on the screen, can I encourage you, uh, if you have your own Bible, to look it up in your own Bible. So that's Genesis 18, and we're going to be reading the first 15 verses. In my Bible, it's entitled, The Three Visitors. The Lord appeared to Abraham near the great trees of Memre, while he was sitting at the entrance to his tent in the heat of the day. Abraham looked up and saw th three men standing nearby. When he saw them, he hurried from the entrance of his tent to meet them and bowed low to the ground. He said, If I have found favour in your eyes, my Lord, do not pass your servant by. Let a little water be brought, and then you may all wash your feet and rest under this tree. Let me get you something to eat, so you can be refreshed and then go on your way now that you have come to your servant. Very well, they answered. Do as you say. So Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah. Quick, he said, get three sears of, fine, of the finest flour and knead it and bake some bread. Then he ran to the herd and selected a choice tender calf and gave it to a servant who hurried to prepare it. He then brought some curds and milk and the calf that had been prepared and set these before them. While they ate, he stood near them under a tree. Where is your wife, Sarah? They asked him. There, in the tent, he said. Then one of them said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Now Sarah was listening at the entrance to the tent, which was behind him. Abraham and Sarah were already very old, and Sarah was past the age of childbearing. So Sarah laughed to herself as she thought, after I am worn out and my Lord is old, will I now have this pleasure? But the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Will I really have a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return to you at the appointed time next year, and Sarah will have a son. Sarah was afraid, so she lied and said, I did not laugh. But he said, Yes, you did laugh. And we pray that uh, as Nicole brings the word of God to us, uh, the Holy Spirit will deepen our understanding of his word and show us how to apply it to our lives. What does mealtime at your house look like? Do you sit at a table? Do you eat off your lap in front of the TV? Do you eat on the run, grabbing a quick bite as you rush from one commitment to the next? Does mealtime look different? If you have guests coming for dinner, perhaps the good tablecloth is bought out of the linen closet and ironed beforehand, or maybe the fancy cutlery makes an appearance. Have your eating habits changed at all while we've been in isolation? There is one meal that has changed in our household since we've been joining together for worship online, and that's Sunday morning breakfast. Our kids usually rise somewhere between 6.30 and 7 a.m., and normally the first thing they're after is some breakfast, but on Sunday mornings for the past couple of months now, we've been delaying breakfast just a little bit because about half an hour before our 9.30 stream begins, Chris or I will make a, patch of, a batch of pancakes. We have this time pretty well now, so we're sitting down with our pancakes, covered in maple syrup, of course. Chris and I will also have a coffee and we eat breakfast together while watching the service. 
There's something special about sharing together in a meal, especially those meals where a little extra effort has gone into the preparations. Well, our passage today is centered around a meal and the significance of this meal, I think, is often overlooked. We first meet Abraham, called Abram at this stage, at the end of chapter 11. And in chapter 12 of Genesis, God calls him to leave his father's household and the land where they were living and journey to Canaan, a land that God promises he will give to his descendants who will become a great nation through which every nation on earth will be blessed. But there is just one problem. Abraham doesn't have any children. As the story continues, Abraham and his wife get older and older and the chances of conceiving a child go from slim to outright impossible. And in chapter 16, they even try and bring this promise into being through their own efforts. And Abraham takes Sarah's servant girl to be his wife and has a child with her. But this was not God's plan. Even so, God affirms his promise to Abraham, confirming that he will bless him with a son through his wife, Sarah, in chapter 17. In spite of their age, Abraham being 99 years old and Sarah herself being around 90 years old. And so we meet Abraham again here at the beginning of chapter 18. It says that he is sitting at the entrance to his tent in the heat of the day when he looks up and he sees three men in the distance. Now we know that one of these men was some kind of manifestation of the presence of God, but appearing before Abraham as a man, because our text uses the all caps for the word Lord. And when we see that, as opposed to the word Lord using lowercase letters, it's actually referring to the name Yahweh, the name that God makes himself known by. If we read ahead, we see some evidence to suggest that the other two men were actually angels. Of course, there are a few different perspectives about who they are and what kind of manifestation of God, uh, of God's presence this is. But putting that discussion aside, the main point is that God came to meet with Abraham. And before Abraham recognizes that he is in the presence of God, he offers to provide a meal for the travelers. This is in This is in keeping with the hospitality customs of that day. However, the humble meal that Abraham offers is not what is provided, but rather Abraham arranges a feast, a feast that God himself partakes in. It appears though that Abraham was not the only one God intended to interact with on this visit. In verse nine, the men ask, where is your wife, Sarah? A strange question, I think, when you consider who's asking. Surely God would know where Sarah was. But then he knew where Adam and Eve were when they hid from him in the garden too. And yet he asked them, where are you? This question from God in Genesis 3, which came just after Adam and Eve's disobedience, came not to simply discover where they were, but it was offered in order to reveal something. Adam responded to God's question, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. Adam and Eve's nakedness is a symbol of the shame they suddenly felt in rejecting God's way and disobeying him. A shame that caused them to hide from him, to hide from their creator that they had previously enjoyed rich, unhindered fellowship with. There had been a break in their relationship. The beautiful world and perfect fellowship that God had intended humankind to enjoy with him had been distorted, shattered. Distance was required between God and his created ones. And now, generations upon generations later, God is fellowshipping with one of his created beings. He is enjoying a meal provided by Abraham, who he promised would be the father of a nation through whom all nations would be blessed, meaning all nations would receive the opportunity to once again fellowship with God. Can't you see the creative hospitality of the Father at play here? 
So back to this question about Sarah. I don't think they were really asking where Sarah was. I think this was the opportunity to bring Sarah into the conversation. You see, Abraham had already believed in the promise that they would be blessed with a son. But we see from Sarah's response when the idea of her having a son is raised that she is not yet fully convinced. Verse 10, then one of them said, I will surely return to you about this time next year and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Now Sarah was listening at the entrance to the tent, which was behind him. Abraham and Sarah were very old and Sarah was past the age of childbearing. So Sarah laughed to herself as she thought, after I am worn out and my Lord is old, will I now have this pleasure? And so it's clear that Sarah wasn't yet convinced that this would be so, although it seems as though she kept these doubts to herself. But there is no hiding our innermost thoughts from God. And God not only reveals his true identity in referring to himself as Lord or Yahweh, but he responds to her doubts. He speaks to Abraham, but I'm certain these words are intended for Sarah. And although they often they are often read with a tone of rebuke, think of the assurance and the encouragement that was felt with these words. Abraham and Sarah had been longing for a child since they first married, and when God promised it would be so, the longing in their hearts grew. And here they were in their old age, their old, old age. Was the promise really ever going to come true? Imagine the, imagine the pain of waiting and waiting and waiting that they experienced. And now God speaks and he says, not only will this promise be fulfilled, but it will happen next year. Verse 13, then the Lord responded to Abraham. Why did Sarah laugh and say, will I really have a child now that I am old? Is there anything too hard for the Lord? I will return at the appointed time next year and Sarah will have a son. So God comes to fellowship with Abraham, but a deeper purpose is revealed through this meal. The confirmation and assurance of the promise and its fulfillment. It's such a beautiful picture of the God who longs to be in relationship with us, his most beloved creation, that he brings us into an awareness of his plan for restored relationship through fellowship with him. He assures Abraham and Sarah that the fulfillment of his promise is almost here over a meal. Generations later, long after the birth of Abraham and Sarah's son Isaac, their descendants have well and truly grown into a nation. And after hundreds of years of slavery to the Egyptians, God miraculously liberates them and leads them out of captivity on a journey back to the promised land. But before this, he gathers them together at Mount Sinai, where he establishes a covenant with the nation of Israel. Exodus 24 verses 9 to 11 reads, Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel went up and saw the God of Israel. Under his feet was something like a pavement made of lapis and lazio, as bright blue as the sky. But God did not raise a hand against these leaders of the Israelites. They saw God and they ate and drank. So here we are again another crucial moment in this creative plan of restoration the forming of a nation that would be set apart as god's people to live for him and serve him and through them would come the messiah the one who would make it possible for all people to be reconciled to god and we have what is essentially another meal with god granted god reveals himself in quite a different way in this scene 
He does not sit down in the shade of a tree and eat of the feast prepared for him as he does with Abraham. But the fellowship offering is burnt up and offered to God. And the burning is a symbol of God's acceptance and consumption of that offering. But God is there. God is unmistakably present. And the leaders of Israel see God and they eat and they drink. They celebrate. They fellowship with each other and with God. God's creative hospitality at work again, revealing more of his creative plan of recreation. There is one more moment of fellowship with God, one more meal I want to draw our attention to this morning, and it's found in Luke chapter 22, the Last Supper. On the night he is betrayed and led away to be trialed and executed on the cross, Jesus shares a meal with his disciples. Luke 20 verses 14 to 20 reads, When the hour came, Jesus and his disciples reclined at the table. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread, gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. At Mount Sinai, the system of sacrifices and offerings to atone for the sin of the people was established. On the cross, Jesus became the ultimate once and for all sacrifice that would make atonement for all sin, for all time, for all who would turn towards him and call upon his name. And Jesus communicates this and reveals this through a meal with his disciples. Jesus, God in the flesh, fellowships with his people. But not just that, Jesus instructs his disciples to continue doing this in remembrance of him. And in many churches, this has become what is known as the table or the Eucharist, which is not something we traditionally practice in the formal sense in the Salvation Army. But I think Jesus is trying to communicate something to us here. Just as God communicated something of his creative plan of recreation to Abraham, And just like he communicated something of his creative plan of recreation to the leaders of Israel at Mount Sinai, whenever the Passover meal was observed as a way of remembering the event, the story of Passover was told and shared. The story of what happened when God spared the firstborn sons of Israel and brought them freedom from the Egyptian slavery. When Jesus said, do this in memory of me, he wasn't simply saying, remember what I've done for you personally, like we often do in a quiet moment of reflection to ourselves, although that's part of it. Jesus was saying, tell the story. Do more than remember. Because to the Israelites, they remembered through telling the story to each other and passing the story down through generations. When Jesus said, do this in memory of me, he was inviting us to participate in God's creative hospitality.
as we meet with each other, as we share a meal with each other, if we're out for coffee with a friend, if we've invited our family, our neighbours over for a meal, when we fellowship with each other, Jesus says, remember me. Tell the new story of Passover. When I stood in your place, when I carried the burden for your sin so that you would be spared, so that judgment would pass over you and you would be given life and freedom in my name. For those of us who are believers in Jesus, who have received the gift of the Holy Spirit, we enjoy the continuous presence and fellowship with God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. And we now have a part to play as we become vessels of God's creative hospitality and share the story of salvation through Jesus Christ. We're going to enter a time of thoughtful reflection now and we're going to sing our theme song for this series, Holy Spirit, Living Breath of God. It's really a prayer for the Holy Spirit to not only enter our lives, but to transform us, that we might be aware that we carry with us the very presence of God, that whether we be all alone or enjoying the company of others, God is with us. And therefore, every moment is sacred. Every moment becomes an opportunity to love God through our service to him. Every moment becomes an opportunity to remember what Christ did for us, his love and his sacrifice. Every, every encounter we have with someone else, every coffee, every meal, becomes an opportunity to tell the story of salvation and the good news of Jesus Christ. We're not yet able to return to worship altogether as we once did, but what we are encouraging you to do, as restrictions lift bit by bit, is to join together in your homes, to invite your friends and family and neighbours into your home and watch our services together and to talk with each other, to share what Jesus has done in your life, to tell your story of encountering and fellowshipping with our wonderful Creator who reached out to call you to Himself. Be the, that vessel of creative hospitality as God uses you as his instrument to call the people you connect with to himself. As we sing this song together and invite the Holy Spirit to come upon us anew, we pray also that God would direct us to the people he wants to meet with and that he would open our eyes to the opportunities we have to, help, to tell his story of recreation.
Almighty God, our Creator God. You designed us to live in perfect relationship and unhindered fellowship with yourself, the triune God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. But Lord, that relationship was broken. And right now we we want to praise you and we want to thank you for the way that you reach into our world and call us to yourself. You don't wait for us to turn to you, but you are constantly, always reaching out to us, moving in our direction, longing to fellowship with us and creating opportunity for us to fellowship with you. And so we thank you, Lord, that you did everything within your power, that you held nothing back to make it possible for the relationship between us to be restored, not because of anything that we have done, but because everything you have done. Lord Jesus, you laid down your life. You stood in our place so that judgment might pass over us, that we might be counted as righteousness because we stand covered by your righteousness. And those of us, Lord, who have uh, turned towards you, sought your forgiveness, and choose to follow your way. Lord, you've given us your spirit so that we might be in constant fellowship with you. Lord, help us never to take that for granted or forget that you are with us. And we pray now, Lord, that you would open our eyes to the opportunities that you have given us to become your your vessels of creative hospitality as you work in us and through us to reach others in our communities to reach those in our families, to reach those in our streets, to reach those in our schools and in our workplaces that don't know you. Lord, you long to be connected to and uh, join in fellowship with all of your creation. And so, Lord, let us not take the opportunities that you give us for granted. But Holy Spirit, we pray that you would ignite a burning desire within our hearts to tell your story, to tell the story of how you reached out and saved us, of how you came into our life and transformed us, of how you opened our eyes to see your majesty and your glory, of how you sought fellowship with us and how you seek fellowship with others. Lord God, we pray that while we can't meet in our church and even when we can meet in our church, that our homes would become sacred places where your story is told and told and told again. Where people come into a knowledge, a saving knowledge and understanding of who you are and just how much you've done for them. Lord, that you would use us to become disciple makers. That you would use us to point people to yourself, that we would not be passive in this work, but that we would be actively engaged as you empower us by your Holy Spirit. Lord, we thank you that you invite us to join in this great work, this great work of reaching your world, reaching your world with the truth and the love and the grace and the hope that we have come to find in you, that we have come to find in Jesus. So be with us each, Lord. Open our eyes to see those who need to come face to face with you and guide us into conversation and into fellowship with them so that they may fellowship with you. Amen. This week, we put a a video online that talks about what church is going to look like uh, for the next couple of weeks. Uh, And we know that that some of you have watched that video, but not everybody has, particularly everybody who watches our services online. Um, So I apologize for those that have already seen it. um, But for those who haven't, this is what church is going to look like for the next couple of weeks. Hello 
by Blue Mountain Salvos. Uh, we hope that you're well, that you're staying safe, and that you're uh, that you're using this time of restrictions to to grow closer to God, but also to connect with each other in uh, in new and different ways. We, uh, Nicole and I, we've been incredibly blessed and encouraged by the way that you have adopted our online services. Um, but we know that it's not the same. We know that that we all miss coming together for for worship, for prayer, for God's word, and for uh, for fellowship with one another. We all miss that. So we want to take the opportunity to talk about what does church look like for us in the weeks ahead. You know, Nicole and I, we have been uh, we've been officers for five years now, and so we've had uh, many opportunities to sit with people in their final moments uh, and to to hear what they have to say. And, and what's interesting is in people's final days, they don't want to make small talk. They want to talk about what's important. They want to talk about uh, the people that they love, the mistakes that they've made, the lessons that they've learned, the things they want to pass on to friends and family. They want to talk about the important stuff. So you guarantee in Matthew 28 and Jesus' final moments with his disciples, he wasn't making small talk. He was only talking about the important stuff. And so in Jesus' final moments, what does he say to his followers? Go and make disciples. That is the thing that was most pressing on his heart. That was the most important thing that needed to be said in that moment. Go and make disciples. That is what we need to be about about a church who makes disciples. That is our calling as a church. Go and make disciples. So how are we going to do that? As I'm sure you're aware, the government has been uh, progressively uh, easing restrictions and churches of up to 50 are able to meet now, uh, but that does not include us. Um, So instead of looking at these government restrictions as a burden, let's choose to look at them as, as an opportunity to get this right, to get discipleship right. So what we're going to ask you to do in the weeks ahead is to form what we're calling discipleship huddles. Um, it's, it's a very basic concept. We're going to ask you to continue to engage with our online services, but why not invite some people into your home to watch the service together and then just have a brief discussion about what you got out of it, basically. As you know, at the end of our online services, we usually let it run for about five or ten minutes and just ask you a a question to just get conversation rolling. But at the end of the service uh, this week and in the weeks ahead, we're going to leave you two discussion questions that we want you to discuss with people uh, in your home. And the two questions are these. What did God say to you and what are you going to do about it? If you've been following our SOAP model, it's, it's the observation application. What did God say to you and what are you going to do about it? And then to pray about it together. And then when we are eventually able to meet together as a church, it would be great if your group then had the discussion, well, now that we're coming back together on a Sunday, what day during the week are we going to meet so that we can continue to have these discussions, so that we can continue to grow together, to encourage each other, to be accountable to each other, and to advance God's kingdom through mission together. One of the greatest benefits that has come from from our online services has been to hear stories from you of of your friends who have never been to church before or perhaps used to go to church but no longer do, but yet they're watching our services online and they're hearing the message of Jesus, perhaps for the first time. This presents an amazing opportunity for you to be a witness. to to begin the process of making a new disciple. Because instead of saying to them, well, why don't you come to church? You can say, well, I I noticed that you've been watching our service online. Why don't you come to my place and we can watch it together? I'll put on a spread. We'll have coffee. We'll watch it together. How does that sound? What an amazing opportunity to advance the kingdom of God. So let's make a choice. Let's choose to not look at these restrictions as a burden. But let's look at these restrictions as an opportunity to get back to basics, 
to get back to what it's all about and what the church should all be about, and that is making disciples. So that together as a church, we can continue to encourage each other, to grow together, to be on mission together for the honour and glory of Jesus Christ. One of the beautiful things about the hospitality of God is that it's offered to everyone. I am, you are invited to the table of the Lord. Uh, So as our our sending out song today, we're going to proclaim that message this morning. Proclaim it to the world that, that he says, come just as you are to the table. I will feast at the table of the Lord. I will feast at the table of the Lord. I won't hunger anymore at His table. 
Just before I give the benediction, I just want to remind you uh, that after today's service, we're going to let the video run for about five to ten minutes, so you have the time to to talk about those two discussion questions, uh, which are, uh, what did God say to you, and what are you going to do about it? Um, Also, just before those discussion questions come up on the screen, you'll also see um, the invitation to, uh, if you are meeting in a group, to take a picture of your group and to post it in the comments section of this video just so that we can see your happy smiling faces and um, and bring a sense of unity to these online worship services so if you uh, feel comfortable doing that that would be fantastic but for now my, my prayer for you and the benediction for you this morning comes from 1 Corinthians 15 58 which says therefore my dear brothers and sisters stand firm let nothing move you Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor for the Lord is not in vain. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord, and to love and to serve each other. Amen.